This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is Professor Paul Wells from Loughborough University, kind of the leading scholar of animation, certainly screenplay and animation, both kind of written numerous books, some of which are on the table in front of you, uh, but also works as a practitioner, as a script editor and writer for Simpsons, SpongeBob, SquarePants, I can't say that properly, and is also kind of uh, working on uh, an animated feature of the film, which he can't tell me anything about, and therefore I can't tell you anything about. But uh, Paul is a kind of um, on the executive of the Screenwriting Research Network and has been a kind of major supporter of the kind of new um, <coughs> burgeoning area of screenplay, screenwriting studies. And we're very delighted that he's agreed to come to, to, down to talk to the cinema. And, uh, just in time to be... Just busy. in time, just in, just in time for me to start look. Hello. Yeah. Again. <laughs> so... Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really uh, appreciate you uh, inviting me. Seriously, I've, I've been seriously ill over the last 18 months, and so it's kind of really nice to come out and just do stuff. And uh, this is one of the first public things I've done in a, in a good while, so I'll probably be a bit ring rusty in talking to you, but thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. You could easily be doing something far more productive with your evenings, I dare say. But, hey, next hour, pin back your life. Here we go. Right. So, um, Written by the animation bot, Trials and Tribulations in the Animation Screenplay. Let's see if I can uh, explain to you what that's all about. First, I'll just give a, just a, a, a small overview of stuff that I've kind of done or am in the process of doing, just so you get a, a sense of kind of the kind of real mixed bag uh, that, that it's uh, amounted to. Um, I'm currently director of the Animation Academy at Loughborough University. We are hugely lucky in the sense that we get to do all sorts of research projects from archival work right through to the development of screenplays, through to you know, professional sort of you know, production aspects that we're invited to do, like special effects in movies and things, things like that. So we do a whole raft of stuff. Um, we're very fortunate that, we, that, that we've got this uh, you know, level of work. Um, Simply, if I have a teeny tiny teeny reputation in the uh, academy, it's about writing books about animation in, in one form or another. One of them uh, in 2007 was a book on script writing. And basically, it's, 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 it's weird really because it's a very straightforward book saying there are lots of different ways to make animation. It's not complex, it's not, it's not you know, pushing boundaries, but what it actually found was a very strange space in the sense that it found itself alongside kind of guru books like Robin McKee's book and Sid Field's book and all the rest of it. And I found myself getting invites all over the place on the basis that a book that was largely about animation seemed to be something that people say, oh blimey, you can do screenplays and devise works in other ways then. You know, we all know that, don't we? We do. But apparently, this was a kind of an innovatory moment for some people and, you know, and, it's, and it's been a successful book, basically. Underpinning it was basically, you know, uh, quite a long sort of career in this. I started out, uh, you know, as a script editor years and years and years ago now on EastEnders. EastEnders, of course, you know, the most miserable uh, soap opera in the history of the world. And I, I count as one of my great, uh, you know, sort of claims to fame is that I've got some gags in there. You know, people do have a sense of humour, you know. People do laugh occasionally. And uh, then I went on and did uh, Casualty, which is a hospital drama. Uh, you know, the most accident-prone city in the history of the world, you know, you had to get people to hospital, you know, four or five people to hospital every episode, you know, so the amount of crashes that happened in that city, you know, no driver would, you know, could get down a road without knocking a pedestrian down, you know, so, so I worked on those kind of shows and wrote scripts and, and did script editing. But then I also, at the same time, was lucky because I was working a lot in radio and I did quite a lot of uh, series around film and cultural history for radio and also a bit of, bit, of, bit of drama. And that led me into some television drama and I did some television drama for a while. And eventually, 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 after long, long, uh, you know, long history, the kind of writing of animation books and the kind of practice that I was doing in theatre and television and film sort of joined up. And I was very lucky to work with Al Jean for a while, uh, learning about how uh, uh, people you know, did The Simpsons, an incredible learning curve for me, offered them whatever I could. Similarly, Aaron Springer at uh, SpongeBob did, a work with, did some work with them, did a very 
wonderful project with them actually over in the Netherlands at Cinekid where we actually improvised a episode of SpongeBob SquarePants for the group of kids. And it was amazing because the kids had nailed the story world of SpongeBob. They didn't see it as kind of like just anarchic and mad and, you know, wow. They knew its rules. They kind of knew what, what SpongeBob would do and how he would behave and why it would happen in the way that it did. It was an incredible session, I have to say, and really very exciting. So all of this kind of stuff kind of uh, has unfolded. And in recent years, I've um, done quite a lot of work in Norway and uh, with the oil museum there. Um, and have put, to, put together a script called The Oil Kit, which is about social history of oil, and, uh, and that's in pre-production uh, at the moment, so that's actually going to be quite an interesting thing to do. And also working as a consultant on quite a few kind of European uh, features. Uh, Pim and Pom is a, 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 a children's series in the Netherlands, and they've very successfully done 52 five-minute episodes, but then they were going to do a 70-minute feature. And it was very weird because I was just with, doing a workshop session there and they brought this uh, screenplay to, to uh, this session. And it was incredible because it just didn't work. You know, it was just a, a screenplay that they were in, having enormous problems with. And they really couldn't translate their five minute sensibility into you know, creating a feature. So it was really great working with them about how they could develop their ideas from really the initial story world. That's kind of what they'd forgotten. They sort of had this great desire of making a 70 minute massive adventure but they kind of forgotten about the core characters and what the story world was. So we had to come right back to that and develop that. So that was a very interesting project as well. We've also been doing quite a lot of uh, documentaries for the uh, Association of British Animation Collections. Uh, we did one about John Hallis, uh, who was the Hallis Bachelor Studio from 1940 to 1995. And basically that documentary is going to be shown, I think, on Sky Art soon as part of their uh, series. We did some uh, work with SEAT, sort of uh, developing their, their, their brand. Uh, again, in Norway, developed uh, a set of scripts for Screen Energy about their, their work. Um, again, in specific aspects of kind of oil production. Great, we developed this wonderful character called Spring and a whole range of other characters who were all springs of one sort or another, only for Spring Energy for them to be over, overtaken and taken over by another company and the whole Spring concept down the pan, you know. But nevertheless, there were some very nice little films that we made accordingly. Uh, last year, uh, we made a documentary about McKinnon and Saunders, who are the puppet makers for Tim Burton's films, and Fabulous, uh, fantastic Mr. Fox, uh, Bob the Builder and so forth, and we have Tim, Tim Burton involved in that. Very uh, nice documentary that, that, that we put together, and that's doing the festivals at the minute, so that's been really good. And currently we're doing a set of small uh, films called Trios, which are about uh, information and information sharing. And uh, basically, uh, I might talk a little bit about those a bit later on. So, I don't introduce this to you as just a mere kind of colouring of all our yesterdays. It's just to introduce to you that there are many different ways of skinning a cat in terms of writing screenplays and in terms of writing for particular genres and for particular kind of outputs. And that really is, is kind of what I'm going to talk about today. So, my fiendish plan. It's no good just putting Paul's plan. Now, because I've got Paul's fiendish plan, you think it's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's going to be one long letdown accordingly, but this is what I'm going to do. So, who or what is the animation bot? We'll have a look at that. Who is Ned Ludd and what should he do? We'll come to him in a moment. Seven deadly sins of animation screenwriting, or more prosaically common problems in animation screenwriting. Correctives, seven writers speak. I've got seven writers to uh, answer those uh, questions. Using the animation long, that's for the kind of you know, critical theory people out there, I can use French. And micro-narratives, micro-narratives. Um, and awesome game-changing conclusions. I know that you wouldn't come to an event like this if you didn't need awesome game-changing conclusions at the end of it, so look out for those. Okay, so here we come. Okay, so, animation bot. Let's look at this. Basically, it was a review of the Lorax that I saw, which was great. It was so damning it wasn't true. Let's have, have a look at some, you know, some, some parts of it. It is fantastically boring, soulless animation that could have been written by a computer program, an animation bot. The basic finger-wagging eco-tale has expanded into a cutesy, overextended movie about a boy who visits a creepy old fellow called the Wantsa, who destroyed all the trees thereabouts. There's another little guy called the Lorax, voiced by Danny DeVito, who is on the side of the trees and nature, can apparently do nothing to help other than address our better natures. The distinctive jaunty rhyme scheme of the children's book is abandoned, except for the Lorax's introduction. 
The film has a surface sheen of plausibility, it says. It looks and sounds as if it should be charming and witty as some of the terrific animated movies from Pixar and DreamWorks that we've been spoiled by over the last decade or so. But it isn't. It isn't, okay? Ha! There is something dead inside. Dead, he says. The young romance subplot is perfunctory, and the basic anti-logging message contrives to be both didactic and pious, while being at the same time mystifyingly impotent. Oh, yeah, he's had a bad day this bloke, hasn't he? It's a bloody Lorax, for Christ's sake. You know. Now, there are no complaints, however, to make about the technical work here. It looks bright and clean and sharp. Excellent. But there is no charm or life. Maybe the time has come for some Ned Ludd, look out for him, to rampage through the studios, throwing laptops out of the window and forcing animators to do some freehand drawing ha! and make up the technical shortfall with some exceptionally good scripts. Oof. And I shall put my typewriter away and go to the pub. That's what he said. Brilliant. Okay. And I looked at that and I just thought, wow, you know, you know, he needs to get out of this guy. You know, just well, bang, what's that all about? One of the most interesting things about it for me was the fact of that last that last paragraph, effectively. This whole idea that because we're making a computer-generated film, that somehow the animation uh, scripts are also in some way computer-generated, that they're not written by people. That the whole idea of, 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 the, of the film's failing is in the script or in the idea that this is just, you know, uh, the same kind of uh, thing as we've seen before but not quite as, you know, full of quality. Good evening, sir. How are you? All right? All, right. Um, <coughs> all of those um, factors, you know, really led me to think, well, you know, I, I've worked in this in, 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 with animation and with animation scripts for, you know, for a long time. And the whole idea about drawing, you know, CG films are made with huge amounts of drawing in their pre-production and their preparation and their development. The CG is just an executing tool. Scripts are still scripts are still scripts, however they're developed by whatever studio in whatever way. And virtually for every animator and for every studio, there's a process that's unique to it. You know, so all of these kind of assumptions about the idea of the animation bot that's kind of pumping out these kind of, you know, banal and empty, em empty films, uh, you know, is a kind of misnomer in the first instance. But given that it's a misnomer, how should we challenge that? How should we look at it? So, this is what I'm going to do, basically, over the next period of time. Let's look at the range, we all recognise things, these things, but let's look at the range of things that you can have in animation. I mean, they, it goes right across the board. We recognise, obviously, the feature animated film, 70 minutes plus, there's TV stuff. We know that they come in, you know, 11 minute, 15 minute, 20 minute, 24 minute formats, but a range, a range of stuff for TV. The independent short across the world, across the world, huge traditions of independent animated films of, of hundred year vintage, and still somehow, in despite of every kind of adversity, we still find that people are making independent short films. That the festival circuit of animation perpetuates and you know, keeps in circulation and keeps a, a global animation community vibrant and healthy. Commercial, public information, music video, all of them you know, take up a, a, a whole range of them, high percentage of them made, it, made with animation. GIFs, internet works, banners, you know, we see, we see these kind of things all the time now, where in almost you know, back bedroom, you know, back office studios, people are making their own stuff. And that's getting distributed and exhibited in, in a certain way. And we're seeing more and more of that kind of, kind of work too. And of course, visual effects and games. You know, most contemporary cinema is, is, is fundamentally informed by animation. You know, King Kong, you know, King Kong. What, what, what would that film be without the animation? You know, it'd be an air show and a lot of wind in trees, you know? The whole at center of that film is animation. You know, Hulk, what would Hulk be? Be a rip shirt, that's what it'd be. You know, the whole centre of those films is animated. You know? So we're seeing animation coming right to the centre of cinema practice, and we're seeing animation in a whole range of, of, of places to, you know, for, that, that are making, that, that are using it, and of course are writing for it. And all of those approaches are different. They're related, but they're different. Okay. Now, in recent years, I've been really lucky in the sense that I've been all over the shop in terms of workshops and, sort of, and, and particular kinds of uh, engagement and consultancy with what was giving this tour about seven deadly sins of animation screenwriting. And I just made up seven things that I constantly encountered in, 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 this, in this stuff. And we did some really good you know, sort of work in, in those workshops looking at that. Now I'm not going to concentrate too much on, on, on those today, but basically I wanted to just pick out 
the, f the first one, which was this, this idea of the Katzenberg conundrum, or what I've called Katzenberg conundrum, because it leads us down the road where we, we can look at this a little more carefully. It came from the fact that uh, Dave Sproxton and Ardman, uh, Nick Park, Ardman, Peter Lord Ardman, had many, many conversations with uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg about the Wallace and Gromit movie, Curse of the Wearer. And basically, uh, you know, Nick and Peter and, and they would say, yeah, thanks for that feedback, Jeffrey, you know, that's, that's it's really, really helpful. But, you know, Jeffrey would, would sit and he would offer his point of view. And one of the big things that really challenged him, and which he, you know, constantly asked them was, what does Wallace learn at the end of the movie? And, <laughs> and basically they all, they all sort of looked at him and just went, well, he, he never ever learns anything. Is that all right with you? You know, and sort of like the whole kind of thing about, you know, sort of the whole classical narrative uh, that Katzenberg required, you know, the whole rites of passage, and at the end of the movie, we all learn something, and kind of like we're all better people, and you know, we've all, we've all moved on in life. Where does that come from? Well, of course, it fundamentally comes from, um, you know, a now very established and very important literature uh, in relation to, obviously, McKee's story, Sidfield's screenplay, Vogler's writer's journey, we recognise all of those texts as fundamental kind of Bibles of one sort or another about the classical screenplay and its structure. Um, in some ways now, uh, it's their moment, uh, you know, is still kind of very powerful, it's still kind of acknowledged as, 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 as driving important aspects of, of, of our understanding of the screenplay, but we're getting more and more kind of versions of, of, of how screenplay should be written and other, you know, approaches to it from, from, from other authors. But you can see that what prompted this question from Katzenberg was an expectation of a formulaic kind of outcome a way in which a screenplay would be constructed, whereby the central hero would essentially learn something. And the whole kind of idea that Wallace, you know, whose whole raison d'etre is never to learn anything, just completely passed him by, you know. So the bottom line, you know, for, for, for Nick and others was to say, thanks very much for that, Jeffrey, we'll bear it in mind, and then ignore it. Because obviously, self-evidently, you can't change the whole character's, you know, level of being. But one of the more kind of purposive responses to this was from a guy called John Crisfalusi. I'm sure some of you have come across him. He's the guy who did uh, Ren and Stimpy. Um, he's also a guy who's, who's just steeped in knowledge about golden era uh, Hollywood animation. Uh, knows every cartoon going, uh, very big Bob Clampett fan, really knows his stuff. And he's vitriolic about writing for animation. Here's what he says. It's written way too long. There's crowds upon crowds, scenes taking place at sports stadiums, impossible stuff to draw. Long, long episodes of boring, meaningless dialogue. Everybody out of character, too many characters. Characters that don't work together. Too much action detail described by people who can't draw, therefore can't visualise. Boring prose, pop culture references, explaining the jokes. Cartoon scripts are a torture to read. You, can do it, you can't do it in one pass, it causes narcolepsy. I believe in writing outlines, he says, just enough material to get across the story and plot. Then you give that to the storyboard artist to flesh out with the director and other gag men. So he's, you know, he's got a particular kind of method there he thinks is best. But I think this is one of the most interesting things that he says. We learn the same lessons that we learn in every animated movie. It's okay to be yourself, especially if you're bland and wimpy. We learn that dads love their kids but have trouble saying it. We learn that cute girls like wimpy guys. We shouldn't force kids to learn lessons in cartoons, especially the same ones over and over again that we don't ourselves believe. You know? So he's really quite you know, you know, fundamentally opposed to the idea of, this, uh, uh, of these kind of movies that are formulaic and, and play out you know, their, their agendas uh, in this fairly traditional, um, you know, moralistically sound way. Where does that leave us, though? It leaves us with the idea of, well, how do the studios and how do um, you know, animation writers work? You know, what, you know, what, how, how, does that, how does that function? Now, I've been fortunate. I've gone into many of the you know, sort of studios across the world, you know, Pixar and DreamWorks and Aardman, a whole range of other studios, too. And it's been interesting to see, for me to see what's on their bookshelves. What stuff do they read? What, what, what stuff that, you know, is kind of uh, you know, enabling uh, for them? And of course, they're weighed down with my books, you know, naturally, you know, naturally. But, you know, these are some of the other ones that they also glance at every now and again. And first one is Illusion of Life, 
which is uh, Frank Thomas and, and Ollie, Ollie Johnson. Um, Richard Williams' Animated Survival Kit, that comes up quite a lot. Visual Story, Bruce Bruce Block. Seven to Sea, uh, Fraser McLean's recent book uh, about layout. Alexander McKendrick's book on filmmaking, that crops up everywhere. Really, really interesting that that, that, was, that was there. Linda Aronson's book, 21st Century Screenplay, and The Art of Dramatic Writing. Now, those are the most common ones that I was discovering in all sorts of people's uh, studios and stuff. And I thought, well, what are they fundamentally getting from these books? And I was, you know, and I started to ask around and talk to people. And inevitably, from the illusion of life, you've got the core principles of animation, the 12 core principles of animation. Why are they important? Well, they're important because actually the 12 principles of animating are also 12 principles of driving narrative. In animation, because every motion and everything is choreographed in a very particular way, every piece of narrative, every piece of motion that carries with it an implied narrative, because you're choosing it. If you think about theatre and you think about film, a director can say to an actor, OK, go from A to B and do it in a very particular way. Be aggressive. So be really aggressive in writing that space. You know, you can say to them, right, there's a phone ringing but you really don't want to answer that phone. So there could be all that kind of you know, pondering, you can stay at a distance, you can resist it, but it's got to answer the phone eventually, it can be a slow move maybe, it could be lots of gestures of doubt, there could be a lot of face pressing, there could be a lot of this, there could be a lot of that and the other, and they eventually pick up the phone. You can't do that in animation. And the reason you can't do it in animation is because you have to do it once. You can't do 25 goes at getting from A to B and see what the best one is. There's too much labour-intensive choice in there. So, the specificity of the choreography is really important. Therefore, the mechanisms of motion and movement in animation start to carry with them narrative and meaning by default, because you have to choose specifically how you get from A to B. So clearly the illusion of life is very important. A similar kind of thing is going on with the animation survival, survivors kit. Richard Williams augments that in many ways. And clearly layout is all about blocking and choreography. So how motion drives narrative and drives meaning is very important. But allied to that are things like Bruce Block's idea that art direction as story design. And it's very, very important in animation. It's one of the reasons why they do colour scripts because the whole uh, tone, atmosphere, and mood of a piece can be determined through design, can be determined through colour, can be determined through co composition. And that is where a lot of the kind of narrative and meaning is actually played out. If we constantly recall that every animated composition, whether it's characters, objects, or environments, has to be artificially created, the illusion of all of it has to be created, we can see that any one aspect of that carries with it narrative purchase. So art direction as story design is a very important component and aspect of that. And certainly they use Bruce Block's book. Though I have to say, he says very little, or, or even nothing, about animation uh, in that. But he does say a lot about composition in, in, in lots of other kinds of films, use of colour, saturation, hue, and so forth. Very, very pertinent to the way in which animators, of course, work. The McKendrick, I think what they're taking from that are largely three things. One, dramatic irony. How much knowledge does the character have? How much knowledge does the audience have? How much knowledge do both of them have? And this is actually really, really important in the way in which any kind of narrative construction works, since it, it, it's the whole basis of suspense, you know, or surprise. Surprise is that, you know. Whereas suspense is all about the fact that in a moment I might shout again but you're not entirely sure when I might shout. I'm giving you all the information that I'm going to shout, and you're just all waiting for me to shout at one point, and that waiting is suspense. But it's all about the fact I've given you the information that I'm going to shout. When's he going to shout? You just, you know, that's the way it is. So you just postpone it for how long you want, you know, and that's the way it is. So, dramatic irony, peripatia, turning points, we all know about turning points, or changes of circumstance. I think that's the key thing in the McKendrick. And triangulation, the whole idea that if there's a character relationship going on, how is that character relationship relating to an audience? Linda Aronson, I, uh, sorry, I think uh, the Linda Ross is about one-line concepts and character motives. I think there's, there's quite a lot of those kind of things. And non-three-act structures and action and emotion lines in Linda Aronson's work. So it's about tools. It's about tool building. You know, any kind of screenwriting at all 
whether it's animation or anything else, is a box of tools. You know, it's kind of like what you know, what do you want to use for a particular outcome and a particular thing? When I do umpteen workshops, you know, people you know who are taking them, young screenwriters, young people who are you know who are trying to develop screenplays, particularly in animation, you know, there, there's some fundamental things that happen. They are aware, of course, you know, of the traditional screenwriter's toolbox, the kind of things that we're talking about that are engineered in you know, things like McKee and Field and so forth. But they're sort of aware that animation's got a screenwriter's toolbox too. Animation can be distinctive, it can offer them something different and something pertinent. So, how does that function? Well, for the most part, they choose the wrong toolbox. It's quite extraordinary how so many of the story uh, concepts that they start working with and start to develop are all, in fact, just human-centred dramas. Just human-centred dramas. And, you sort of, and one of the first questions I actually say to them is, why aren't you doing this in live action? You know, what, what, what's the problem? Why don't you do this in live action? You know? And they sort of go, oh, um, oh, because I... Um, because, um, and they, so they can't really answer that question because they've configured it around kind of a, a human story. And there's lots of reasons why you might, you know, do a human story in animation with human figures. Lots of reasons why you might. But you've got to know what they are, you know. Since you might as well employ actors if they're going to do traditional acting, you know. What else, you know, do you want to do with that if it's going to be animated? So, one of the kind of things then is the forgetting that the work is in animation, that the animation can offer some specific forms of expression unavailable in live action. And I've always kind of, you know, assumed that to be so. And I'll explain why later on. One of the kind of biggest things, and I'm sure any of you write screen, screenplays uh, or teach screenwriting, uh, it's one of the things that really gets on my work actually, and really kind of like, you know, you encounter quite a lot, is that sometimes people view screenwriting as common sense, you know, it's common sense, and, and basically only works on the level of kind of, you know, live action classical narratives that we see all the time. You know, the amount of projects that I've worked on where people who don't actually write scripts say, oh, you know, the thing is, what we need to do in this script is, and then they have an idea, and that's perfectly fine, the idea's brilliant, but the whole idea about how you execute and reveal the idea is, is the act of script writing. And for the most part, they sort of go, well, you write it then, and then that's it, that's what it is, can I have a co-credit? You go, oh, I don't think so. You know, because the whole kind of idea about having an idea, and then its execution, its revelation, are two totally different things. And that's what a kind of, you know, script does. So this common sense thing as well, I mean, like kids do it, you know, you, if you, if you, if you, if you give, ask, ask a kid to write, you know, a, a script, they, they write, right, it's style, it's kind of, John, hello, Jim, hello, John, how are you, Jim, I'm very well, thank you. And it's just all dialogue, of course it is, and, that's, and kids do it that way. The fact that you then ask them, well, where does this take place, you know, oh, blimey, I think it's the playground, what does the playground look like? And then you get them to describe the playground and write the playground and write the action, and then ask them to say, well, do they need to say any of these things? And they go, no. And suddenly they have an action sequence and a possible sequence that works, as opposed to long list dialogue. You know? So all of those kind of factors are at stake often with young screenwriters who've got some you know, experience, but nevertheless almost see it that way still. It never ceases to amaze me. Oh, you know, you've got to, if you're going to write an animation and you want to, you need to understand what animation does for you, surely. You know? So there's those kind of factors at stake. So, it provokes the need then to choose appropriate tools for the project in hand, from both boxes, but prioritising the animation tools throughout, you know, so you know, it's always an act of juggling, whatever you do. So, other key problems then, that you dis that discovered in this way, and I think, I think you know, they're really, they're, they're quite interesting because they reveal kind of some of the ways in which we might sort of work. There's often a lack of realisation that animated characters are constructed first as visual and conceptual signs and choreographic principles, and only later as possible figures with backstory and inner motives. You know? Often the design of a character, uh, the nature of their core characteristic, is their driver in, in, a, in, in a narrative. And if we, if we design the idea that they have psychological development, um, that's often then borrowing the tools of the traditional screenplay. Within animation, it's often about the way in which they act and behave, and act and behave in relation to objects and environments. And there's a kind of a shift of emphasis there in what they mean and how they design and how they work. 
So that conceptual meaning often is very, very important. It's one of the fundamental things about animated characters. Essentially, Donald Duck, you know, is the average irascible American. But the fundamental principle is frustration, you know. Everything that Donald Duck is, does is about frustration. And all the narratives that surround his core characteristics are driven by that. And most of the time, animation works in that way. They take dominant characteristics and extrapolate from them. Sometimes, obviously in major movies, Pixar obviously do this in things like Toy Story, they develop characters. But they develop them in very small frames. And they develop them around core dynamics and emotions. If you take Woody and Buzz, one of the key issues about the first Toy Story was dealing with jealousy. You know, the whole kind of idea about how jealousy drives a particular model of behaviour. And that's pretty much informed the, you know, the, the first film. I mean, the rest of the films, there's a key driving emotion or a key driving aspect that changes the nature of the behaviour. So all of these kind of principles are very, very important for thinking about animation. Next problem, sequence items. Because animation is so good at action, so good at motion, so good at chases, so good at things that are moving dynamically, people write scene after scene after scene of just that without any kind of uh, way in which the, the, the scenes are often motivated or, or changed or refreshed in some way. And, you know, and I, you know, I point to the whole kind of classical era and say, you know, virtually every cartoon that was done you know, is a chase cartoon of one sort or another. But there's enormous invention within that, within that very small you know, sort of, sort of uh, generic model. Um, and really, the, 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 the scenes that you, you know, the, the scripts that you see are characterised by sequence after sequence after sequence of this without any kind of motivating principle. And even if there were, there's still not enough dynamic in the way that the story is being told using those, you know, using, using those kind of uh, motion sequences. Um, certainly, the desire to over sequence in animation is very uh, common. Um, and of course, a real challenge because. Um, most of the time, animation is a much more condensed and saturated language. And so it tends to be the fact that even animated features are much shorter because of the kind of you know, tension and saturation of what's actually their design -wise. So all of those kind of factors, very important, overwriting of sequences. This is a big one, certainly in terms of people writing you know, more traditional scripts and treatments, a lack of what I call visual transition writing, in which imagistic flow is preferred to montage or extended dialogue. And what we see happening is fundamentally to communicate narrative and theme and idea. A lot of the time people, I'm sure, you know, all, all people who, screen, who, who teach screenwriting, I'm sure all of you encounter the idea that, that students have great ideas. You know, not, ideas are not the problem. It's about how they're revealed, you know. Themes are not a problem. How do you reveal them? When people behave, you know, when, when people have a big emotional thing, he is very sad. Okay? It's that whole thing about kind of like, well, how do we see that? Is it only about tears? Is it only about sitting glumly in the corner? How is sadness revealed? You know? And that is always about what do we see happening? What is being juxtaposed? Why is it being juxtaposed? Why do we know our understanding of that person's emotion is functioning in that way? So visual transition writing, and I'll come more to that a, a bit later, is very, is very absent in a lot, of the, a lot of these kind of screenplays. A lot of the time, and I mentioned this earlier in relation to Pim and Pom, is kind of not reconciling short form and long form issues by using, extending, and accumulating what I call micro-narratives. And again, I'll talk about that later. Animation has a very condensed animation, a, a, a very condensed image uh, construction, you know, there's a density in the imagery uh, in terms of you know, the nature of its design, what's going on in it, and why it's going on in it. And so a short animated film and a collection of short animated films, when you're at festivals, and, you know, you know, I don't know if people have done this, but if you watch animated films back to back, your head's in a kind of like, because they're so dense, actually, in terms of the kind of nature of what they do, that the accumulation of them is just almost too much. And you have to kind of manage that very carefully when you're writing in long form too. So those kind of uh, issues, again, will come to micro-narratives in a moment. And of course, most of the time, this, this characterises, you know, I suspect students, all of us, at, you know, at one point in the game in relation to a lot of things, is trusting the first idea. You know, the first idea is the only idea, you know. 
And most of the time, the first idea is somebody else's idea, is a banal idea, uh, is, a, is an idea that's been done you know, a million times before. But if you are going to do the chase, the gross-out gag, the parodic gag, can you refresh it? That's the challenge. Or can you do something different? Can you, can you put your ideas under pressure, which is always my big sort of phrase to them. Put the idea under pressure. Ask more questions of it. If you do that, then you challenge yourself to do something different with it. So they're the common problems that we encounter all the time. So what about the correctives then? What about the correctives? Well, let's, let's, let's have, a, have a look at some of those. Now, Sadie Frost, Moira Buffini, and Paul Sandler. Um, he's a singer in Kiss. Um, and these three, I, before I embark on any writing, I remind myself of these three things. Sadie Frost says, you imagine before you start that there's a cathedral. And the moment it starts on the page, it's a garden shed. And then you try and make the best shed you can. And I really kind of empathise with that. You know, you really kind of start when, you, when you've got a big idea for writing, or you are writing, you've got this, wow, it's going to work like this. And then you write. And then you read it back. And you go, this is, it's all right. It's all right. But it's not, you know, it's okay. You know, and then that's kind of like, makes you go, right, okay, just scale down and focus on what you can achieve in terms of, you know, within your limits, and hope that that grows, and hope that that works. So you're not put off, basically. Maura Buffini, she says, scripts are fluid, malleable, plastic documents, yet strong, robust, clear. They must be open to change. Scripts are like the screenwriter. And I like that, I like that. I think, well, okay, that just gives me room to work. I don't have to get it right first time. I can play, I can change, I can fiddle, I can, I, can, I can do all sorts of things with it. But what I can do is to try and keep the clarity of what I'm trying to say and how I'm trying to say it. So I remind myself of that. And I also remind myself, don't bore us, get to the chorus. You know? <laughs> and what does that mean for me? Well, it means to me that two things. One, in a certain way, if you recognise that your own writing is not engaging and it's not functioning well, then in a certain sense you've got to stop, you've got to kind of rework it. But also, you've got to get to the point of empathy. What's the point that will connect with audiences? What are the things that will connect with the people that engage with you know, the work that you are trying to do? Is there a point of empathy that you can try and work with? You know, the chorus, we'll all join in. But it's that moment where you can get people to be empathetic with what you're writing and how you're writing it, whether it's getting a gag across or getting a laugh, or whether it's getting an emotional response that makes all the difference. So I remind myself of those things before, before working with stuff. And in great tribute to Stephen, also, I, I look at people like David Manor. David Manor is a you know, great writer, I think, in all sorts of ways. But there's something very particular uh, about, about what Mamet does. Um, he's interested, of course, in the kind of quest of the hero. I mean, like as, as many, many writers are. He's interested in the idea of making the audience want, want to know what is going to happen next. One of the absolute fundamentals of any kind of screenwriting, I think. Who wants what from who? You know, these are all kind of things that go back to obviously people like Stanislavski and so forth. How do you get your kind of actor motivated? But then, kind of, what are the kind of wants and needs within a scene or within a story? What happens if they don't get it? What are the kind of consequences? Why now? Why in this moment? Why is it important in this moment? That's particularly useful for animation, actually, the why now. Because you've got to get that specificity of choice that I was talking about earlier, because you know, animation is so labour intensive that you can't do a scene a million times over. You know? You've got to make a very particular choice. So any scene asking why now and what for is very important. He likes the idea of aesthetic distance, the whole kind of way in which somehow the, the, the form distantiates itself. Now for me that's very pertinent to animation because as soon as you see animation of one sort or another, it's an enunciative form. It tells you it's animation. It tells you that it is constructed and illusionist. You know? And that aesthetic distance I think buys it some currencies that uh, enable all sorts of uh, what, you know, approaches to the work. He talks also in, in this particular collection, Bambi vs. Godzilla, uh, about the five gag film and about ways in which you know, we can tell, think about structure differently. And he talks about this as routine, the idea that when you build a routine, like a stand-up comic, or when you build a routine that actually tries to get peaks and troughs in terms of how it, how it delivers its narrative, whilst at the same time building in vignettes of, kind of you know, comic, comic events, effectively. And again, that's very, very similar to a lot of kind of the construction of animation, and, and certainly short-form animation, but certainly sequences within long-form animation. 
He sees the kind of long form drama as kind of a postponement of gratification in a certain sense, the way in which you know, we're constantly delayed until you know, the, the kind of climax of the film in relation to how we can resol resolve a situation. Animation is less, less invested in that kind of idea because most of its gratifications come actually more as a string of pearls and, and often and regularly than they do in postponement shows. He also uses, interestingly, Marv Boonland's film Bambi vs. Godzilla as his title. And it struck me, given that he doesn't really talk very much about the film itself, why did he do that? Well, let's watch it and find out. Now, Mark Lulin, you know, very funny guy, made lots of great funny stuff, but this, this one is always kind of, you know, his masterpiece, you know, um, and, it's, and it's often referred to, uh, you know, in relation to kind of obviously animation production. But I, I'm intrigued, you know, by the idea that, that, um, that somebody like Mamet, who writes at length and so complexly and with such density and, and layers, picks this as it were, as, as a kind of a, a summation of a certain kind of idea about kind of the, 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 you know, the, the, the film industry, you know, the, the act of the writer and so forth. But for me, you know, it, and we can all see the kind of, you know, what, what's going on there. It's a micro-narrative. It's a very, very simple micro-narrative. You know, Bambi is going to be trodden on by Godzilla. That's it. That's, that's the action. But around it, but around it, are all sorts of ways in which he's prompting all sorts of expectations, you know? The credit sequence is telling us about the nature of credit sequences, you know, and is, is, is undermining the nature of, 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 of all of those kind of factors. And of course, privileges the idea of the animation auteur, you know, the whole idea that one person can make an animated uh, film. And, you know, we've got those kind of factors uh, going on. In the midst of it, we can look at the content and say, you know, is this just a fundamental and joyous critique of Disney? Well, yes, it is, isn't it? You know, and you know that's that's very simple. But there's a, one one simple act going on in that film, and one that we have postponed, and we can probably kind of guess it. We can probably anticipate it. We probably think that, hang on, just a minute. We, he's told us the title: Bambi meets Godzilla. They're going to meet at one point. How are they going to meet? Bam! You know, very very simple. End game. Fine. The end. It's about genre, it you know, takes us out to genre, asks us to understand how our, our particular kind of generic elements, plays out its gag beautifully, even does a nice little end game with, the, with, with just the nails coming back down, you know, on, the, on, on Godzilla's feet. You know? Very nice little gag. But just that, just that babble then about interpreting that film, and you could probably take that, you know, further if you wanted to. You know, what is that? It's a minute, you know? And it's the intensity, it's the saturation of the image. This whole idea about micro-narratives working in a way that actually have intensity and association. You know? Animation does that a lot. You know? It really kind of focuses on particular kind of composition of imagery that has symbolic association, sign association, particular kinds of signification that make it a very saturated image. So for my money, this is, this is, this is why it, is, it works as a kind of summation of some of kind of mammoths. But certainly, once we start to talk to you know, animation writers, we start to kind of unpack some of their views of that as well. Now, somebody like Andrew Stanton, really interesting guy, very intense guy, uh, you know, wrote Finding Nemo, Wally, 
hugely disappointed by his John Carter film, you know, not doing, doing so well, but very intelligent, very interesting guy. And, you know, very, very um, theoretical about the nature of what he wants to achieve in screenplays, you know. And here's, and here's, you know, here's just some of the points that he raises. And this one I use all the time. It's, it, I've got to tell you, it's, it's, it's a cracker. It's absolutely, because it's so obvious. Intellectually, aesthetically, emotionally, make me care. Make me care. Why do I want to watch this film? Why, you know, what should I care about? Who should I care about? When should I care about them? You know? You ask that to a student about, about, about the stuff that they're making. You know? Why should I care about this? Why should I care? Why as an audience should I care to watch this? You know? And they go, I don't know. I don't, you know most of the time they don't know. You know? But if you don't know that, what we should care about, then why should I care about it? You know? And all the kind of construction of how you might do something surely is about those kind of kind of connections. And he's really committed to that idea. How do you find screenplays, characters, particular kind of nuances that actually make us care? You know? And the caring, of course, has to start with the nature of how you start to write. And he, for him, it's about making a promise. You know, it's, that, it's a premise idea. It's about if you set something up in, in, in a screenplay, how does it become a promise to keep? An audience has to know, as it were, how that promise is going to be fulfilled. He committed to lots of, uh, you know, sort of animation of, of stories without dialogue. And of course, the risk that he took with something like Wally, the first 45 minutes, is essentially 45 minutes of visual storytelling. And it sort of turns into another movie then. It's a kind of weird kind of, you know, combination. But the first kind of 45 minutes pretty much function without dialogue. And what he argues for that is that there's inclusivity in that. If, if visual storytelling can work, it should work universally, pretty much, on those bases. If we don't need to know about dialogue, if we don't need to hear dialogue, but the visual storytelling can work in the way that tells the story, animation should be particularly good at doing that, because you can construct those scenes highly deliberately and, 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 and specifically to do that, then there should be inclusivity in that. He likes to get the idea, as, we, as all screenwriters do, in any kind of thing that people are watching, that the audience are working, but they're not consciously working. And that's the kind of big thing, isn't it? We, any, any kind of movie that we're kind of invested in and we enjoy, or any kind of story that we enjoy, we know that we're engaged with it, we know we're working with it, we know that we're, we're going with it and we're figuring it out. But it's a very fine line. If there's the moment where we actually lose it and we go, what the hell is this about? What is going on here? I don't get this, you know. Or, you know, something actually makes us makes the story fail for us. Absolutely makes the story fail. I don't know whether you've encountered that in movies. When 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 suddenly you get a moment and you go, Oh come on. You know, that's not good. I mean I had that right at the start, for example, of uh, Star Trooper Starship Troopers 2. You know, one of my favourite films. But the reason I got it right at the start was suddenly, suddenly, it turns out that all of those bugs that smashed everything to pieces unremittingly in the first film are now so worried about humans that they're going to infiltrate their base secretly, you know. And I'm sitting there going, what? Why would humans suddenly become so kind of powerful, so interesting, so brilliant at what they do, that you don't have 25 bugs smashing your base to bits, you know. The whole premise of the first film was that they were unstoppable. Why did they suddenly in the second film become, ooh, them humans are clever? They're not, you know, it's nonsense. And, and the whole kind of story premise fails, you know. I'm sure all of us have had those, have had those moments, but he's really, really keen on that. He says, you know, you've got to keep working at the uh, screenplay so that those moments don't occur, that they, there isn't a failing moment where they disengage. Compulsion to deduce, he calls this, you know, two plus two, we all reckon it should be four, but, you know, will it be four? And how can it be four? Animal characters. He talks about animal characters in interesting ways. I've written a book about animated uh, animal characters. And he sees the idea of animal characters as ideas about completion, that the relationship between humans and animals is about, here's an animal, it is different from us, and so therefore our connection with us makes us complete. I don't really kind of, I don't, I don't kind of buy that, really, but... It's a very interesting thing, given that so many animated movies, of course, have got, you know, animal characters. Big thing, again, normal screenplays do this, inevitable but not predictable. So we know almost inevitably what's going to happen, but how it gets there shouldn't be predictable. You know, that's, and that's, you know, that's a challenge for any writer. 
how they choose is who they are. Most of the time, you know, the most, most character development work is all about that. In animation, it's very specific, actually, again, because of that idea of, 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 of choreographies of animation. What do they choose and how do they choose it is a specific kind of way in which something is animated to do so. And then finally, empathy. This whole idea about finding points of empathy. What is it that an audience will care enough about as it were, to offer you a kind of conditional response to what you do. Um, very, you know, very interesting guy, very thoughtful guy, and some of the kind of points that he raises there. But let's have a look on the other side of the coin, a guy called Prit Pan. I don't know whether people come across him, but Prit Pan is one of the most acknowledged independent uh, short film animators in the world. Uh, he's, he's an Estonian, brilliant filmmaker, and actually sort of influential on Hollywood by a kind of back door. He, he, he was very influential on people like Igor Cavalier, who went to Hollywood and did things like the Wild, wild Strawberries, uh, Wild, wild Thornberries even, um, and Rugrats and things like that. Different kind of aesthetic to caricature, which came from this kind of Estonian base uh, with Prit Pen. And he's interesting because he's got, he's got a very different way of constructing things. His is all about A plus B equals C. If you take this unusual thing and this unusual thing and you place it together, see what happens, see what C is, and from there, C plus D might equal this, and so forth. So we're trying to bring unusual things together to get different kinds of outcomes. He says that any kind of narrative that he's developing is a field of possibilities, and he tries to keep it as open as possible as he's developing a field of possibility. It could be this, it could be this, it could be this. And he still pushes, you know, pushes the kind of potential narrative on in exploring it that way. He sustains and revises a timeline. So sometimes he'll take an action that <coughs> suddenly happened up here, but he's going to put it right at the front just to see how it affects what happens thereafter. He says, keep the characters as abstract as possible for as long as possible. So in other words, don't nail them to a set of characteristics in a typical kind of screenplay sort of way but keep them abstract, keep them, as it were, you know, got with a dominant characteristic or a dominant idea. Do that for as long as possible in order that you keep your narrative flexible and therefore potentially original. Problematizing the situation, always a common thing into the screenplay, but once you've got those points, you know, uh, determined, you can do that. But one of his biggest things is to try and move the animated film towards a kind of novelistic conception of story where the sense is achieved through the mind of the viewer, that the mind of the viewer is effectively doing the work, that in essence the film isn't explicit and complete in itself, it's about inviting you in to see how it works on those terms and conditions. Very interesting Greek and very, um, you know, very complex guy in terms of what he's doing, and of course many of his films are seen to be therefore quite surreal in what they're doing, but actually they all have an inner logic, they all have a very particular logic that comes out of this method of, of, of doing screenplays. Now, for those who work in the, in, sort of in the academy, work in universities, one of our real kind of problems in recent years has been all these kind of practices, you know, which are practices, have been had to be viewed as theory, have been had to be viewed as research, you know, and, and often these things are actually, you know, very complex areas to think about in terms of how nominal practices might be thought of in relation to research. One of the few things that I've that I tried to do is to try and think about, as I explained earlier, about the kind of literature that you know studios are using, and I see those as theories of practice. You know, and, and certainly you know the kind of guru books are theories of practice, and they should be understood as such in, their, in my view. And how that might be aligned to the ways in which practitioners actually work, and how that might feed out into other kind of narrative uh, sort of conceptions and, and theorisation. Like for me, the prepared approach, as it happens seems to match with something like Kersler's act of creation and his idea about bisociation. Now here, for the most part, he's talking about the construction of gags. Most gags are about A plus B equals something surprising C, which is funny, you know? But of course, as, 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 uh, as Kersler points out, here, um, you know, you can have two conceptual systems that reverse so that one is undermined, so basically it can be jokes, or fused into a larger synthesis, so you've got something fresh, something new, or juxtaposed to illuminate oppositions or tensions, so the two things actually show that they're opposed. 
So this kind of process then can be theorised. You know, it's not as if prepare it's practice is something that can't be theorised or seen as a model of research. But it's often about how we relate literatures and how we relate theories of practice that actually, you know, enables us to talk about them more formally. Gil Alcabetz, very another brilliant analyzer, very, very interesting guy. And here's one of his ones, very, very important, is sound as a core signifier. You know? Sound is so important in animation because it can do so much work to prevent animation. Animators are always looking for, looking for shortcuts so that they don't have to animate, so that they don't have to do particular things. Sound does a lot of great work there. And basically, in relation to teaching students, I've often told them, listen to radio drama. Radio drama is very, very good at evoking places through sound effects, evoking action through sound effects. And it's very, very useful as, as narrative tools. And Gilbert, in all of his films, uses sound as a narrative driver so that he can do something different with the animation. He says one of the key things about being an animated screen, animation screenwriter is to accept the shift from the invisibility, the seamlessness of classical narrative photorealism to accept the self-enunciating, authored artifice and illusionism of animation. He just says, make that foreground, you know? It's illusionist, why not you know, make that explicit? Why not be clear about that? But crucially, I think this is one of the most interesting things that he says, that animation can immediately facilitate the shift from this man to a man, from this space to a space, from the tree to a tree. So in other words, from the literal to the symbolic and archetypal. So you've got a literal act and a literal composition, but at the same time it always resonates with the possibility of systems of association. And that's what we're seeing with Bambi and Godzilla. You know? We're immediately looking at a moment of systems of association, just through the, the, a key narrative act. And animation is very, very, very good at doing that. In terms of this idea about tool development and theory, you know, I think it's really kind of useful to sort of like often mix and match these things. Linda Aronson's book, 21st Century Screenplay, I really like this book. And it's a book that kind of tells us about different kinds of ways of constructing a screenplay. Brilliant, you know, and, and all evidenced in contemporary movies. Great stuff. But one of the kind of things that she stresses as a, kind of, as a, as a tool in these kind of compositions is an action line and a relationship line. So when you're writing, essentially, you know, keep an eye on what's the action, what's the action, what's the action, what's the action. Allied to that, what are the relationships, what are the relationships, what are the relationships, what are the relationships? No problem with that, right. But for me, insufficient. I'm sort of looking at animation and thinking, yeah, it does action and relationships, but what it does, you know, very, very powerfully actually is conceptual stuff. You know, it does foreground its idea um, very, very readily and very, very clearly for the most part. So I was thinking, well, what, what, where, where could I get, how can I fill that gap? And I remembered. Uh, John Gardner's book, The Art of Fiction. I don't know if people have come across that. But he had three, three kind of ideas, three landscapes paradigm, he calls it. Action, so that's doing and description. Hey, there it is, action. Consciousness, motives and intentions. Well, I sort of map that to relationships a bit. And then he says meaning, authorial intention, idea, outlook. And I'm thinking, right, that could be useful. So basically, in terms of some of the kind of work that I've done in workshops, what I've done is say, right, we have action, we have relationship, we also have concept. You know, how is the idea either being fulfilled in itself, or how does the idea develop and grow throughout the narrative? So all of those things are very important, so long as you keep an eye, of course, on the tools that you've got available to you in animation itself. Okay? So I'm going to show you a short little film now. Yeah, we're not doing too bad, that's okay. Um, short little film now called Gagarin, and then I'm going to explain some particular animation tools for you. Thank you. 
Пошла. There are very clear traditional screenwriting tools going on in there. It's a three-act structure, it's a central hero, it's a chorus, uh, there's a set of rites of passage, there is a conclusion of sorts that he, you know, resolves his problems and you know, gets to a kind of punchline, a conclusion of sorts. But at the same time, um, it's you know it really is a vehicle that demonstrates all the specificities of what animation can give you and how it can give you it. So let's have a look at some, you know, some of these tools. And I've been talking about these tools for any number of years and use them all the time in kind of you know, animation screenwriting stuff. And of course, it's the idea that animation can offer us fabrication, the physical and material creation of imaginary figures and spaces. Now all of these, of course, you know, are recognizable. These are caterpillars, you know, who become butterflies. Um, but hey, come on, you know, here, here are some characters who are caterpillars who get embroiled in, a, you know, one of whom gets embroiled in a, in a, in a badminton match uh, and so forth. You know, these imaginary fabricated worlds, but they've got their inner logic. Crucially though, they employ metamorphosis. And this is one of animation's biggest and most important tools, of course. The ability to facilitate the change from one form to another without edit. We see those transitions on screen. We see the changes on screen through the drawing, through you know, through play, through computers, whatever they are. We see those transitions on screen, and of course that immediately gives us a different model of storytelling. The whole second act, the whole sequence in the second act of the badminton is essentially a set of abstractions, a set of metamorphoses of movement, of, of change, of a badminton's uh, matches choreography. Um, you know, pretty much undoable. Uh, in, 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 you know, in, in, in live action. Um, all of that is about the particular qualities of metamorphosis uh, in animation. But of course metamorphosis is the theme of the film too. You know, a, a, a caterpillar who becomes a butterfly. It becomes a model of change. Condensation, the maximum degree of suggestion in the minimum of imagery. And this is why I, I suggest really functions best in relation to the best kind of animated short films, but even in the development of, of, of longer features. What is the maximum degree of suggestion in the minimum amount of imagery? Make the imagery count for you in relation to its associations, the way in which it resonates with particular ideas, particular narrative connections. And allied to that is symbolic association, the use of abstract visual science and their related meanings. When I say this, people go, oh, I'm not getting desperately union about this, aren't we? Well, no, we're not. We're great sign readers all the time, aren't we? We go around and there are signs around us all the time. We recognise what that, that sign means up there in relation to the exit from, the, from, from this room. 
We see traffic signs all the time, we see banners all the time, we read our phones as sets of signs all the time. We are brilliant sign readers, and animation is very good at selecting signs to be resonant in that way. That's why it's very pertinent in relation to graphic design and indeed illustration, because there's a resonance and intensity in the way in which signs and symbols are used. And in this particular case, we might not recognise immediately the signs being offered to us, but of course, you know, the caterpillars in terms of their change to butterflies offer us metamorphosis. But it's no accident that this is badminton. It's no accident that this is a shuttlecock. It's no accident that this is a Russian film. It's no accident that it's called Gagarin. What does that, what does that, what does that shuttlecock look like? Look like? Well, it looks like a space capsule, doesn't it? So one of the underpinning themes of this is the failure of the Russian space race. It's a very nice, resonant little metaphor without ever pushing that in your face. But that's basically because we have chosen badminton. We chose tennis, and he clings to a ball. It's a totally different film. You know? If you've got that design, that shuttlecock, suddenly you've got other forms of metaphoric resonance available to you. Penetration, John Alice, 1947, came up very importantly with this concept. The visual, an animation is absolutely brilliant at doing this. The visualisation of seemingly unimaginable psychological, physical and technical interiors. Absolutely brilliant at showing us the inner workings of a body, the inner workings of a machine, the inner workings of the psyche. It's brilliant at dreams and fantasies and solipsism, you know, brilliant at depicting those things. Think about every shampoo advert you've ever seen. I'm preoccupied with shampoo you know, adverts all the time. Because in every shampoo advert, there's the science bit, you know? And the science bit shows us the follicle, you know? The hair being cleaned by little, little, little bubbles, you know? And we're all convinced that that shampoo does the job. But it's an animation that's telling us that. It's animation that's showing us that. Utter nonsense, all of it. But brilliantly visualised, yeah? Those interiors are the things that give us, as it were, the hidden worlds that are all around us. Animation is very good, you know, unpacking into those areas. Equally, animation is very good at managing time and space. The ability to control speed and time, and timing in the staging of past, present and future means that a 10 minute film can do a million years worth of history, or it can do 10 minutes on one second. So, very important in terms of projection. An ally to that, performance. You know, the, all these areas in terms of how the animator becomes the actor, the way in which the performance is projected through, uh, you know, into the various forms and materials that animation is made. An ally to that, of course, the specificity of choreography. I've already spoken about motion as a particular mediator of meaning and narrative principles. An ally to that further, anthropomorphism, of course. It's no accident that, you know, that so much of the time animation uses anthropomorphism. You know, this bottle, you know, it's just a bottle of water. Stick a couple of eyes on it and a mouth, and suddenly it becomes bury the bottle. And as it happens, this is a fruit flavoured water, and they're pretty elite, that crowd. You know, they hate Buxton water and things like that, it's just so plain. They don't mind the bubbles crowd, they're all right, they've got a bit of, you know, a bit of fizz, a bit of, a bit of excitement to them. But because they're flavoured water, they know where they stand in the world, you know. Easy to make metaphors, you know. Basically, you know, that that can be animated and suddenly Barry the Bottle has got an adventure that's just through that set of associations. And, you know, we've embedded the character through that. Very interesting too, of course, that anthropomorphism enables you to circumvent all sorts of other taboos around human beings. If you, if you characterise animals, objects and environments, they can play out all sorts of things that would be taboo in relation to you know, the nature of, of human representation sometimes. So it's a very kind of liberating uh, idea in many aspects. And crucially again, sound. Sound is an important catalyst and stimulus for most narrative and symbolic action in animation. So, toolbox. A toolbox that allied to, to micro-narratives can actually give us a whole building block from short interstitials, short films like Bambi and, and, and God, Bambi meets Godzilla, and basically as uh, building blocks towards longer narratives and more developed narratives uh, in feature animation too. What all this requires, for the most part, are several things. And I always go back to single panel stuff and GIF stuff to reveal it. Even if you're a great animator, you've still got to be aware of film language. And film language is very important. And even in something as playful as this, you know, what we're seeing is an understanding of how film language works. In a horror film, you know, all of that you know, intense shadow of, of a potential knife is here turned into the presence of a duck. 
you know, brilliant, brilliant, nice, brilliant idea. But it's about the idea that, in principle, all animators need to understand film language. I went, uh, was an external examiner on an MA in sound and animation once, and I thought, that's brilliant. That's a brilliant MA, it should be. And I arrived, and basically there were 20 minutes worth of animation, along with 20 minutes worth of sound. Nobody was making a film. Key then was knowing film language as well as animation and sound. You know, it sounds an obvious thing to say, but it's absolutely imperative in terms of making animation tools function well. Go back to the political cartoon often as well. Political cartoons are very resonant. Here's an, a, a, a one that's making a very obviously uh, key statement uh, about Beijing in 2008, uh, taking the the uh, the symbol of the games as a runner, but obviously as you can see transposing it with, with execution and making a big point about the nature of you know, uh, human rights issues in China. Um, but the intensity of that image again is what I'm pointing to, is that you don't have to kind of overstate that case. The political cartoon is very good at resonating in that way. Animation you know, can extend the form perfectly well. It's a good one. It's, you know, it's a bit cheesy, um, but, it's, but, it, but it's one that I find you know, titillating. Um, and so it's, you know, it's a young woman who's blowing out a bubble, um, and when she blows out a bubble, you know, her breasts come in, and you know, blows out a bubble, breasts go out. Ha ha ha, we might say. And indeed I did say ha 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 at first. But the most important thing for me there is, like with many things, there is an embedded narrative in that. An embedded, an embedded narrative. It's a simple gag, but the embedded narrative is breath, you know. And if we go back to people like Beckett, I mean Beckett had a play, you know, based on the whole kind of concept of breath. But here, Breath is a narrative. And think about the narratives that are embedded in so many uh, of our things. Pest is very good at this, so on eatpest.com, he's a very good animator. And he's very good at, for example, taking a thing like a recipe. A recipe is a narrative, you know, and making a film around the narrative of a recipe. All I'm pointing out to you here is that in most motion and in most movement, there is an embedded narrative of sorts. And it might give us, you know, something as specific as a, as a, as a GIF or it might give us the imperative towards particular developments of character and narrative. And then of course, crucially, what can the act of animation itself give you in terms of its own visual illusionism? And again, here's just a, you know, a gif that shows that kind of repetitive sequence of how metamorphosis works and how the process of composition, depth and what have you can work in those forms too. So a combination of those languages you know, again, gives us an additional aspect to that toolkit. So the micro-narrative then, just a, a, a short list of some of those before we, before we draw to a conclusion. When I'm working, you know, with, with, with groups and stuff, um, I, 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 I suggest any number of starting places for micro-narratives. And here are, here are some, um, and I'll give you some uh, examples for, for, for some. The single movement or gesture can be really a great starting point. And sometimes, you know, you know, work with drama students on this. And just the act of someone pointing, you know, as a starting place, that's the gesture, that's what it is. And actually constructing a set of, set of narratives off the basis of that in terms of the single gesture and how it drives a narrative is, you know, part of this kind of idea about uh, building from a micro-narrative in terms of extending, uh, you know, whatever you need to do, whether it's a GIF, whether it's a short form, whether it's, you know, a feature. The shot, of course, you know, if you are more, if I'm working with filmmakers, working on the nature of the shot and what's in the shot can be very important. Incremental design, somebody like Paul Dreesen is very, very, uh, you know, geared at the idea of the formal aspects of how design tells a story. So here in The Boy Who Saw the Iceberg, one half the screen is literally his coloured, everyday world, the other side of the screen is, is his dream world and what he's imagining going. And it's, it's a very simple device, but it's one that he uses in a number of forms. So the nature of how design in animation constructs the story uh, is another starting place. The icon or symbol, very important uh, aspect. And again, I, I often start off with you know, a character in this way or a situation in this way. Uh, this just happens to be a, a, an image from a film called A Man Called Kozyavin. And essentially, it's about a bureaucrat. That's the starting place, a bureaucrat surrounded by, by, by paper. And that becomes the kind of symbol of how you can resonate the story afterwards. Pest, as I say, you know, animation is always reinventing objects and items. Roof sex, absolutely brilliant. Two chairs having sex, absolutely brilliant film. And you know, he is brilliant at reconfiguring objects. 
Uh, he's got a fantastic collection of objects from the 50s, and he reconfigures them in all sorts of uh, very short narratives. And he did absolutely brilliant. He did a retrospective in Portland. They lasted less than, less than half an hour because it was 20 sort of like, you know, about 30 you know, second films. Uh, and then we talked about them, you know. But they were all terrific and all resonated far more than many features do, you know. So reinventing an item or object, I do that all the time in sessions. The spot gag, often spot gag movies, cartoons, spot gag movies like Bill Plimpton's are essentially lists, you know. They are lists of things that happen that constitute an episodic narrative. It's one of the most, you know, straightforward ways of doing things in many ways in terms of screen development. But I use lists all the time as starting points for you know, uh, screenplay development. The single subject exchange. Now, th where this goes back to is when I used to write on soap operas. Because in, when you're writing on soap operas, you constantly, constantly have to write the same scene, actually. Blocking scenes, postponement scenes, scenes that don't reveal anything until 10 episodes later. And you have to keep writing scenes that actually are essentially the same, but you've got to refresh them in some way or another so that you don't reveal that he's had an affair with her you know, because that's going to happen in ten, 10 episodes time. But here are the two people involved, ooh, how do we prevent that happening again? You know. The single subject exchange. The sorry scene, for example. Endlessly you have to write sorry scenes. Something happens the night before, going to go around this morning and say sorry. You know. But there's a million ways of saying sorry. This is a lovely film called John and Karen. How do you invent the sorry scene? Basically you cast your two characters as a polar bear and a penguin. And it's absolutely brilliant, sorry scene. It's actually, he's going around to apologise for the night before, having, having, having criticised her because she only catches small fish. And, you know, and basically he's going around to apologise. And just in reconfiguring the sorry exchange as an exchange between creatures in this way, it's a brilliant reinvention. Have a look at all of these are, you know, are, are, are on YouTube. I'm sure you'll pick them up. John and Karen, lovely single subject exchange. The focus incident, I often do this, like the, the, the small version of, 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 of Seven Samurai, uh, sorry, of, of Rashomon, effectively. Single incident, four different perspectives on it. How do people understand that? It's a brilliant, um, it's a Serbian film called Four, which takes an air crash and four people's investment in it. It's a lovely thing, but I do single incident stuff uh, with from four perspectives quite often. The generic motif, one of my favourite ones, is J.J. Sablemeyer's ambiguously gay duo. Uh, taking the superhero and in some way trying to reinvent it. And this is great because it's about two apparently gay superheroes who all the villains, instead of megalomaniacally trying to take over the world, their only goal is to try and out the two, the two, the two superheroes. Very funny, very nice uh, address of the subtext of superheroes in terms of its kind of homoeroticism and so forth. So these are all just, you know, as I say, single... Sing uh, single subject, uh, micro-narrative starting places, to join in with the set of tools that I've just been talking about. Here, for example, is a lovely starting place micro-narrative for a recent feature. People know this one? People know this one, they? This is from Up. This is, this is the starting image for Pixar's Up. Um, it's a wonderful starting place, a real kind of, you know, grumpy old guy, and we know that by the colour, by the mood, by the whatever, with a whole set of colourful balloons we love and joy. And the contradiction and complexity of that, you know, is a starting place for something as brilliant, I think, as, uh, as up. Here's, um, just, got the time at the right time? I've only got a few more minutes. Um, I, some people might have seen this one before, and I just wanted to just take a piece of writing that I'd done about a single incident, and it's just, uh, uh, and, and a gag incident. Um, it was in a, a series called 2D TV years ago, and it took a tennis player called Tim, Tim Henman. Tim Henman, I'm sure yeah, some of you might know Tim Henman. Um, the great promising, you know, Brit before Andy Murray came along, but always who failed at the last, you know. And uh, basically I decided to write a script about Tim Henman choking. So, Tim Hinman now leads by two cents to love, on, five games to love, on, 40 love, on, match point, if he could just hold his nerve. Okay. 
Very, very simple. <laughs> okay. So, script to that, and the only reason I'm including this is because I just wanted to just talk about this kind of idea about transition writing, writing in relation to animation specifically. So, obviously, you've got the, you know, the, the normal kind of ideas about exterior day tennis court at Wimbledon. British tennis hopeful Tim Hammond stands preparing to serve. Crowd dressed in British fan regalia sit watching. Scoreboard in the background, of course, the heaven is two sets, five games, and four to love up against rival Andre Agassi. Commentators of Tim Hammond now leads two sets, another five games, another four to love. We hear arbitrary cries of come on Tim from the crowd. A mole with a Union Jack top hat emerges from the grass saying, come on, Tim. Why did they put that in? Well, it's this thing about su suspense again, you know. I was trying to just build just a few seconds more before he actually did the, the, the serve. And the come on, Tim, so everybody who's, who's a Brit tennis fan, that it was always that, come on, Tim, come on, Tim, you know, <laughs> the most impressive thing you'd hear at that time. But I thought, how could I create the suspense? But you've got to do something with it. And I thought, well, it's grass. Moles can come through grass. We'll have an arbitrary gag about a mole saying calm to as well. Just to build this kind of suspense at that moment. Quiet, please. Match point if you can just hold his nerve. But this is the key bit in relation to that whole minute sequence. We see heaven serve from his point of view. Point of view can be really important in animation because you can reconfigure all sorts of things from someone's perspective much easier. From behind the ball and the racket, and it looks towards a gassy in the distance. There's an advertising board behind the gas in the words coat, sprite, and Lucozade advertise. His racket suddenly becomes molten. Again, this is right for animation. And I'm trying to get stuff that animators to animate. The tennis ball metamorphoses into a huge bowling ball. A gassy's racket becomes huge and the tennis net rises up and turn. The camera moves past the net. <coughs> and a gassy towards the words on the advertising board. Coat changes to choke, sprite to shine, and Lucozade to give up now you the girl's blouse. On the soundtrack, there are sci-fi sounds signifying interior noise in Edmund's mind and a pulsing heartbeat. Cut to Edmund in close-up, sweating profusely, his teeth chattering. Tightness Edmund's, John obviously doesn't go to pieces. Edmund breaks a hundred pieces with Tom and Jerry's style. Okay. So what I'm just trying to indicate to you there is that this is a single notion, he's going to serve. He's going to serve. Yeah? And effectively, I'm reporting the few seconds between the act of him serving and doing so. So it's really a compression of time over that period, but building into it all the things that happen in those seconds, which become animatable, and basically are the micro narrative of those gags, of that gag. Yeah. So it's that kind of you know kind of process that I'm trying to talk about. I'm going to miss this out because we're doing because we're doing stuff like that because you're now waiting for the awesome game changing conclusions because we're all out enough and everyone's stayed with me this long. So I do I do thank you for that. The awesome game changing solutions are these. <laughs> they are these, okay, very simple, okay, approaches to animation screenwriting need to strike a constant balance between the tools and theories available to orthodox live action film and TV writing and the different approaches and applications in creating animation. Studying, comparing, and applying theories of practice and practices of theory developed by practitioners is important in refining the specificity of practice required by or available in animation as a tool. Identifying the core commonalities and differentials in live action and animation screenwriting will encourage more pertinent and effective use of tools available. And I think that's why it's pertinent to all writers. And then finally, the animation bot can be taken to the scrapyard and Ned Luck can be encouraged his practice led research and its outcomes. I'm sorry, I'm a bit ring rusty and that was a bit long and a bit babbly, but thanks very much for listening. Fantastic, thank you very much. An enormous amount of uh, condensed animation start in, in uh, we're covering a lot of, I think, really interesting points, both about screenwriting, maybe also the points that you're talking about theories of practice and practice of theory, which uh, I think are kind of very relevant both to people who are practitioners or theoreticians of, of screenwriting. Um, my I'm allowed, because I'm sitting here, to ask the first question. So maybe I would like to ask, like, you got up there the commonalities and differentials between live action and animation mm -hmm. screenwriting, and I felt whether one could say that actually, really, all screenwriting aspires to be animation screenwriting. 
and, uh, and whether, I mean, because the one thing that you described that seemed to me only animation is the fact of not being able to edit ever. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to me that lots of the things about uh, metaphor, about motion, about abstraction, about getting people to kind of understand concepts of things yeah. that feature film does at its best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of the time it kind of maybe gets caught up in using the fact that you have to get actors to do it yeah, and kind yeah. of to allow itself not to properly engage maybe with the kind of stuff that film at its best does. I mean, fact, I wasn't going to quote Merleau Ponty, yeah. but there's a kind of thing where he talks in these lectures about what the cinema of the future should be like. Right. And it seems to me that actually it maps very much directly onto the kind of total art work, well, which yeah. is kind of working as rhythm, as image, as yeah. sound, and as kind of beauty. I mean, my, I mean, my sense is that, is, is that I mean, part of this is historic, of course, in the, in the sense that what you find yourself, certainly I have anyway, arguing for over X amount of years is the distinctiveness of animation as a form mm -hmm. on the basis of, ta of getting that noticed, you know, because for a long time in the academy, of course, you know, animation really was, you know, hugely marginalised, ignored. So part of the kind of idea about creating specificity was about being polemical, effectively, saying that this is an important art form and, and, it, and it should be more recognised, should be more acknowledged, should be, should be more engaged with. So that, that was part of this strand of thinking. But equally, really what I was finding was, 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 was certainly the more I was practising in different areas, the more I was teaching, the more I was kind of working in these things, that, that there were more fundamental crossovers between live action and animation than were being acknowledged, shall we say, you know, in the sense that um, certain kinds of, of, of design of classical narrative and certain kinds of filmmaking, you know, were taking up elements of how animation, you know, uniformly functions anyway. But this was getting less acknowledged. So once again, you were saying, hey, look, look, look at all this stuff going on. Then you get a kind of period of cinema where really our independent cinema now embraces all sorts of ways in making a film. And if you take someone, for example, very particularly like Wes Anderson, you know, Wes Anderson, Wes Anderson's films, you know, somebody who's almost a mannerist, almost a mannerist in terms of, you know, the construction of his films, the nature of the composition, the nature of how he, he choreographs it, very similar, I think, to aspects of animation in a lot of what he does. No, no accident that he did Fantastic Mr. Fox. But equally, I think in that you can go back to art cinema and look exactly at something like Peter Greenaway's cinema and see exactly the same kinds of things going on. You know, and, and, and it seems to me that really what part of this process is, as well as kind of arguing for a certain kind of specificity in animation, is to also say that its currencies really are part of a live action cinema unacknowledged in many ways. And, and in that sense, um, I don't think there's anything groundbreaking about saying that, but I think it's getting more acknowledged just in the practice we're seeing on the screen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one tradition, whilst may, may facilitate asking questions, is I think we have some kind of wine and glasses here. And normally we start uh, now so that we can uh, get the, uh, get the uh, questions going. It also encourages people who haven't been before to ask questions. So, uh, Paul, do you want to? Yeah, I'll have whatever's going. Uh, red or white? Yeah, uh, white. Also, I, mean, I should say, because we, we're always bound to say this, of course, is that two important journals for you to consider are obviously the Journal of Screenwriting, which we, you know, it's many, you know, people have participated in and, and uh, put together here, and my own uh, animation one. There's copies of that there. People want to have a look at that. And there's also a card there that you can take away with you. It's got my email on it. And if you're interested in doing anything for that journal, that's fine. If you're interested in doing anything to do with screenwriting. There's your link. You can take it in. Me and Steve. And Steve, there's yeah, actually a lot of people here, isn't there? That's right. Yeah. So, so, you know, um, part, and also part of this, of course, I mean, just thank you, it is about the fact of trying to bring these kind of things together. I mean, certainly within the screenwriting group, for example, um, you know, we're seeing more animation writers now, but when we first started, you know, we sort of, you know, sort of lone people at the back sort of going, hello, you know, and sort of like, so it's really good that that's coming. And this is what this is partly about as well. It's a sort of a, a kind of encouragement for 
you know, those dialogues take place between those groups and to encourage people to get involved in that. <coughs> I just wonder in part, just following up what Adam was saying, was it, it seems to me that what shifted is actually thinking about film, traditional film, and you know, when the, the, the medium was so tied up with the ability to replicate what is out there, yes. you know, that Bazinian yes. pressure, which was, was always resisted, but had a real strength and a power, yes. actually. Now that's really gone in a yeah. sense because we can't trust anything we see on film. It's all CGI and yeah. blah blah blah. So it seems to me that that's in part what has shifted. But now oh, well, traditional filmmaking has, has moved to the nature. Yes. Yeah. Become. I mean, certainly within film studies, I yeah. would say that you know that there's little doubt that you might even argue there's kind of crisis of content there. You know, the whole kind of thing that, without doubt, animate. You know, I mean, film has always been constructed. Yes, but now, yes, but course, now yes. the nature of, of, of the degree of its constructiveness yes. is so uh, you know, extensive that it's much more towards the condition of animation. Yeah. You know? And of course people like Lev Manovich have made this point, you know, in language and new media. But long before him, people like Adam Cholodenko and then animation studies, you know, have made these kind of points about sort of animation's intrinsic relationship to how, you know, it informs cinema the cinematic apparatus per se, you know. But it is about different kinds of construction of the image and the way in which computers, the digital shift, has effectively changed those pipelines, changed those models of construction, you know. And it's what's given animation new life, I've got to say. Yeah. Because um, I think animation and animation studies was stuck, you know, I think it was stuck. And sort of like, you know, I, I think it's given new life to it. There's been a good row going on as well with kind of like, um, I don't know, people like me that sort of like go, right, animation, look, we're over here. Animation, come on, stay, stay over here. And there's the, the, the group that, and, and, and saying, hey, look, animation relates to loads of other disciplines. And then there's the row that says, look, come on, bring it into film studies. Film studies needs this, yeah. you know? So Karen Beckman's got a collection, Suzanne Buckingham's got a collection that are really directly speaking to film studies, going, look, you should have taken notice of animation. Trouble is that that literature takes very little notice of animation studies. Which is a bit of a pisser, you know, I've got to say. But, hey, that's the way it goes, you know, that's that scholarly life for you. But, there's no doubt that it depends where you want to take the debate. For me, I'm much more interested in taking it out to other disciplines. And I suppose I'm much less concerned with philosophy and more with method, I think. More Mourinho than Martinez, that's me. <laughs> Um, about 30 years ago, I made a film about Richard Williams. Yeah. It was wonderful, The Thief Who Never Gave Up. Did you yeah. make that? Yeah. That was fantastic. When he's in so the square, chaotic. Um, when, when I made that, animation was right at the heart of, uh, of, of, of British culture. Yeah. Uh, there were films Richard set out to make, The Thief Who Never Gave Up, as a traditional film. Yeah. But. On, on the screen, on television, there were those fantastic ads. Remember, yeah. the, remember the BP story oh, with yeah, the yeah. oil rigs? And the, was it the Tango Bear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all of that. that sort of stuff. And it was right at the heart, and it was there in front of us on the screen all yeah. the time. Certainly the commercial industries, you know, I mean... It's and the two fed off each other. Yeah. So you got these fantastic narratives. And it, it just feels now that it's gone into a ghetto. Right. Um, I mean, I loved Toy Story, uh, Lego the other day. It's yeah. great. It kind of took me back to something that actually worked for two levels. Mm. But animation on the screen, it, it doesn't, it's not a wide general appeal anymore. It's, it's ghetto. Yeah. And how are you going to get it out of that? Well, I think, this, oh, this is, I think, to be honest, truth be told, I honestly feel that, that it's always been the case, that, actually. In the sense that whilst there was, you're quite right, there was a kind of zenith moment, I think, of kind of the way commercial industries embraced animation and embraced as it almost the experimental approaches to animation as ways in which brands could take on a fantastic look and so forth, you know, they could do that. And that facilitated independent films and obviously the, the festivals kind of like, you know, brought that to the, to the fore. But at the same time, ironically, I mean, feature animation was going, you know, very downhill at that point. Disney was really kind of flowing into kind of mediocrity, really. And, you know, other feature animation across the world really wasn't very buoyant either. 
So you've got, you had a situation where on the one hand there seems to be boom, but on the other hand bust, and that's always been the case in animation it seems to me. There always seems to be something of that sort. One of the things that went wrong in British animation, I think, was Yellow Submarine. Yellow Submarine ought to have been not merely a landmark film in its own right, but it should have ushered in a whole new era of kind of, look, look, this is what animation can do. But because its graphic design was so un, basically unrepeatable, un, uncopyable in a funny way, you know, it almost arrested itself in that, in that moment, you know, and it almost took Bakshi in America to sort of crassly reinvent animation as an adult form, you know, in terms of Fritz and, and the underground comic, to kind of like, in a certain sense, get animation somewhere else, you know. So I think there's always been that. I mean, nowadays, I think it's, I think it's difficult because every, I think it's all very schismed. We, we've got feature animation, we've got the sitcoms as they work, as they do. There is still a buoyant, you know, set of international animation festivals that deal with the independent sector, you know. Um, we've still got, boy, bizarrely, student films being made all over the world. I don't know how that's happening, but it is, you know. So you still see student films sort of happening everywhere. The commercial sector still uses animation a lot. Um, but all of them don't seem to join up, you know. The, the, all those industries and all of that kind of co-working and collaborative working don't join up very much. And even when they do, you have bizarre moments. Like, um, I went to uh, Studio OKA, uh, with Mark Crast and Phil Hunt, people like that, brilliant filmmakers, and they had the Lloyd's Bank campaign. And they, you know, they did the Lloyd's Bank campaign. And I talked to Sue Goff, uh, their producer, and I said, oh, this is fantastic, isn't it? Look, Phil's got his film out, you know, Mark's got his film out, Lloyd's Bank campaign, you, you know, you just must be, you know, thrilled. And she said, yeah, I'm thrilled for the work. She said, but do you know, everyone thinks we're so successful, we've not got any work. So she said, I've got to actually now get a showreel to get round everybody to say that we need work. She said, because they all think we've got two independent films out and the Lloyds Bank campaign that we don't need to work anymore. And it's just really weird that, you know, that this is what it's like. There seems to be boom in terms of what's out there. Great independent films, brilliant commercial, but bust on nobody's giving them work. Joanna Quinn's the same. Joanna Quinn, brilliant, brilliant draftsman. Fantastic films. Did the Sherman campaign for years and United Airlines for years. Brilliant whilst that all was going on. They then decided to stop that, different campaigns. But her, her design and her drawing is so distinctive that nobody wants her for commercials because they say everybody will think of Charmin and United Airlines. Boom at one level, at another level, brilliant animator, you know, that actually, you know, is struggling at one level, you know. So it, 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 it's hard because it's schismed and it's hard to get one lot of people understanding the work of another and so forth. I've almost seen that as my, my, my life's work, to be honest, try and bring these groups together in some form or another, but it's not easy. Just to cheer you up, um, I've been tasked by the BBC to do an 80 minute animated series feature. Fantastic. That will work across all ages. But there you go. It's a treating and historical subject. Brilliant. Brilliant. You see, that, you see the most yeah, important. Thank thing. God I've come to your lecture because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean the bottom line to it is that for me, you know, that is the irony that you, you know you travel around and stuff is happening. You know, stuff is happening. Bizarrely, something carries on. You know, um, and you hope that there's continuity to those things and it inspires somebody else and something else can happen and, and so forth. I mean, it's just weird. I mean, working in Norway, for example, and working on their stuff where money is no object. I mean, that is the bizarre thing. You sort of sit there and you sort of like, I think we need some green screen for that and those two actors doing this and I'll direct that, it'll cost this, yeah, okay. You know, and, that, and that's, that's what they do. It's, you know, there's, it's the oil money, is great, you know. So you can make that stuff. Go other places and say, oh, blimey, do you need two actors? You need a green screen? Bloody hell, you know. And on, you know, so, you know, yeah. it's a hard one, but I, I, I think... You just have to just keep a, an argument for the form, and you know, and hope that, that things will develop and grow. Certainly, you know, this object to say at the beginning, I, uh, I can't talk about it very much, but I've been commissioned to do a feature, which is based on an adaptation of, of, of a children's story, um, and it's got some quite big money behind it. And I'm certainly glad that I've been given a, a go at it, but of course, there's a lot of pressure in that, and, um, and of course, it could enter development hell like a million films and not happen. So it's it's that thing where you just go. I'll talk about it sort of when it's done, you know, and then it's easier to talk about. So, so you know, um, there are possibilities, but they often are just chance, left field, 
like most of the stuff really, I mean the whole of my career has been a happy accumulation, I don't think any of it's been planned, it just sort of happened, you know, so, I'm sure it would be similar. You know. I'm, I'm, I'm struck by a very, very interesting seminar, first day, thank you for that. Um, it, it, the, the overlap, as it were, between, as you said at the beginning, the animation is coming in at the edges of, almost central to films, more and more the CGI. Yeah. Live action, a component of it, is CGI, and it is to that extent animated. Mm. What's interesting is, you know, you have delivered, something's commissioned as an animated film, then a certain mindset comes to it, and perhaps people like you come to it, whereas in the rest of the world, people are coming to a, a live action film with these other elements. Definitely. They're not really thinking of. They're not thinking like animation. Of course they're not. And they're, they're, not, they're not listening to what animation could do. No, no, no. Or how that could impact on the... No, on I mean, and, and truth, be, truth be told, I mean, the, the, these are, you know, these are buoyant issues within the, the academy, as it were, you know. I mean, I, I can't, I, you know, all the kind of stuff I've done for years um, has been really arguing for animation, you know, as simple as that. And, you know, you find yourself in conferences, often in very small groups. I mean, when I first started, I mean, you know, just no one talking about animation, you know? And so, like, you sort of stand there thinking, I I'd like to just share this with you, you know? And so, like, and, and, you know, you give a two penneth and you, you share it, but it's taken a long time for there to be a recognition of animation anyway, even full stop, you know? And yet, ironically, you know, you look at the ten, you know, top ten, ten biggest movies and most of them are animation. Or well, CGI-driven. I mean, yeah. Or CGI-driven, yeah. absolutely, mm -hmm. you know? Now, that's not to say that there aren't issues, you know, like with all films, there might not be issues of quality in this and all that, but um, the bottom line is, it's amazing how there's this sort of gauze that comes down that people don't see that it is animation, you know, uh, you know, it's issue, you know. So, so that's what we're constantly sort of trying to say, look, it is, honestly, <laughs> honestly. Sorry, you were going to... Oh, I just want to say thank you, that's lovely. I'm, I'm, I'm a screenwriter and I'm dealing with an animation commission and I'm here with um, uh, the animator. Okay, <laughs> very good. <laughs> because uh, I think it's the, the most difficult thing is that collaboration with you are going to actually work with somebody who at the end has an input yes. in what we have to. But I wanted to hear a little bit about your um, experience handling this three act or five act structure. Yep. I mean the big sort of make macro structure of the yeah. feature film because I think that's terribly difficult. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm experiencing in my second draft. Yeah. My, I mean my sense, my sense is, in, in a certain certain way is that when I did a lot of theatre work, that became much more seemingly important to me. I, mean, I think it was mainly because of that Stanislavski thing, of kind of like, find the objective in the moment, here's the objective, but the ultimate objective is there. So there's a series of objectives that move to uh, an end game, you know? And I've tried to sort of like adopt a little bit of that in this kind of <coughs> micro-narrative building block process, that if we, in a certain sense, get the resonance out of each development of an iteration of how these narratives build and how they work, then as long as you re-look re back to what you have achieved, what tends to happen is the thematic kind of emerges, you know, you have a sense of what the concept is and how the concept can be developed, but then in a certain sense the deeper themes or the more complex themes kind of emerge as you develop the work. So, in a certain sense, what you start to do is evolve the possibility of what, you know, as it were, that arc might be. But it's always still a question of checking and rechecking to see if there's consistency in that, and if indeed you told the story that reaches, you know, that, that potential outcome. Working in the way that certainly I've been working with, you know, feature writers or with even short form writers, one of the kind of biggest issues really is to not be stymied by the idea of what supposedly you want in terms of an ending or in terms of a kind of completed uh, conceptual outcome but to actually evolve the material towards that to let the thing as it were allow itself its complexity you know to allow as it were you to distill ultimately what you want to say because it's always a set of choices you can go in so many different directions you know. on the other hand I have worked in a way that said find the ending first you know, I've, I've done that sort of strategy too, you know, what's the end, what's the beginning, what's the journey in between? And it depends on the project, I've always found, you know, it depends on what you want to achieve. Um, but this evolutionary structure out of resonant images or motifs or whatever that constructs a different kind of narrative often, um, for me anyway, is resonating, you know, some different kinds of ideas that 
you know, a little bit fresh, a little bit ways of, of doing things and depicting things. And working with a lot of kind of European filmmakers, you know, on features over the last few years, it's been great to see things going up on the screen that are just a little bit different, you know, a little bit, a bit, a little bit unusual. Um, and that's partly because we're not working with, you know, um, very established structures, but moving with structures that evolve out of the imagery and the, and, and the concepts that you use. I don't know if that answers the question. No, no. Inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask another? Um, well, he wants to ask. Oh, sorry. Come round here with your question. Well, uh, <laughs> but an observation what's been said is that bizarrely, my father was the guy who did the people. Uh, Russell Hall. My father. I, I, I remember Russell when I did the film. I must have a chance. <laughs> um, but I think what happened there was that the success of the Richard Williams studio in World Young Boy to Rabbit gave Russell Hall the opportunity to access his own company. Mean, that's all the folks of Richard Williams studios have been doing the same success. Yeah. Um, well, the, I mean, you know, clearly the interesting thing about Richard Williams, it seems to me anyway, is that, you know, he really is, you know, Obviously, my greatest animators that have been in the film, but he is really an absolute classicist, you know, and somebody who is both revered for that, but at the same time seemed to be out of touch with that in a certain sense, you know. And and you know, I mean, certainly in Thief of the Cobbler, I mean, when you finally see the you know the, the thing that it became and, and all the rest of it, you, you just kind of feel how you know how awful that experience must have been for him. And, and so forth, but you know, it, it's that sense that, that somehow, you know, Roger Rabbit was was important in turn, in kind of reviving a certain model of classicism that was not just about a kind of a Disney style. You know, that it did incorporate Warner Brothers. It did recognise Fleischer's input. It recognised cartoonal stuff in a broader sense. And in a certain sense, you know, Williams adapted to that. You know, I mean, sort of like the cartoon that begins Roger Rabbit and the cartoons that follow are much more, when, when you think about it in the Warner Brothers style, than they are in the Disney style. You know, they're animated with that classicism, but they're much more in a kind of Warner Brothers cartoon, an MGM cartoon. So I think, you know, the, you know that, that moment was very important because, you know, with the Spielbergs and so forth involved, animation history was being profiled. You know, there's this desperate sense that People don't want to forget what animation history has, has contributed. But at the same time, you know, as, as life moves on, film moves on, animation's marginalisation in that, um, you know, again, has been part of the fight. You know, you've had to just say, look, it is important. Look, look, it's important. It's contributed a lot, you know. Um, I'm amazed, really, that film studies has really absented animation for so, so, so long, you know. Um, there's a strand that's been there, but it's only con comparatively recently people said, animation, that's quite interesting, isn't it? You know, that's just kind of weird, really, but it's just the way it is. Uh, mm. Sorry, I think there were two questions. My, the question I want to ask, you, you said um, you were talking about this, uh, sorry, I was jotting down some of you know, so but you are talking about the, the idea that uh, the, ca the character starts as a kind of visual choreographed yeah. image, yeah. and then you may or may not bring in a kind of back. Yes. And I just wondered, <clears throat> there doesn't be quite clear sort of generic distinction there because you, you mentioned, I was in, as soon as you said that, I was thinking of Toy Story, I'm going to talk about Toy Story. Yeah. And isn't the idea there that there are characters who should not have a backstory? Yeah. And the jokes that they do. And I think of my own head, kind of, kind of like the budget, the most recent James Bond film. Yeah. You know, where you really, James Bond shouldn't have. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a very interesting kind of idea. I mean, for me, because, you know, so many characters, you know, in terms of the way in which animation is developed, come through design first. People tend to draw first you know, in terms of evolution. I mean, so Nick Park was like that. I mean, Nick Park, you know, his, you know, his endless sketchbooks of scenarios and of, and of, and of possible, you know, visual gags, um, possible characters. I mean, they all look the same, you know, they've got the same teeth, and got, you know, whatever, but... The, 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 you know, the reality of it is that they have this core concept that is their driver, you know? And in a certain sense, you know, do we, as you say, do we want to see Wallace as a young man with a tiny puppy? I don't know if we do, do we? You know? <laughs> or if we do, I'm just thinking, what will that be about, really? 
Well, I mean, you know, can we? <laughs> was he once a genius and he had this operation? You know, and became Wallace. You know, I don't know, but you know, it, 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 like you say, there, there is a certain fixedness about certain characters that you can't and shouldn't extrapolate too much from. I think, in, in, in many senses, animation works very well in that sense. You know, our expectations of Bugs Bunny are quite limited, <laughs> but we want him to do that stuff. You know, Daffy the same. You know. Um, you know, you know, Wallace, the same, you know, I mean, if he suddenly took on genius terms and conditions, there's something that, 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 fixed, that, that shifts that in a way that's not enabling in a funny way, you know. Um, there's a bit of me that says it's been interesting in kind of European features because there is this desire to try and actually shift the characters and move them on psychologically and to use animation's capacity for, you know, psychic uh, kind of illustration, you know, to see the internal mechanisms of uh, how somebody thinks and feels to develop those kind of characters, and and, and as I mean something like Prince, I don't know if people have seen Princess, but phew, I mean that, I mean that's really challenging, you know. It's a, it's a um, story of a, of a of a young girl uh, who is the daughter of a uh, a mother who's worked in the, in the porno business, and basically the, the kid becomes precociously sexual, um, you know, as a five or six year old. You know, and it's a really, it's some really challenging stuff in there. But it's because animation can do it. You know, animation can do it. Animation is very, very, uh, you know, enabling in showing us stuff that you, you perhaps couldn't really touch too easily in live action. You know, um, and that sort of, you know, more adult approach is certainly characterising a lot of European features. Um, um, well, I have a question because I've been struggling as a screenwriter with this and. Having gone through the Disney system and done a lot of work for Disney in the animation department, that what does a character learn? Yeah, all that Katzenberg yeah, yeah. stuff that you were talking about. And what I love what you said about um, it's not, uh, it, it's the audience mind yeah. that we really are trying to engage and let them put the story together in the way that they're going to tell yeah. the story. And so I was thinking, of, could you expand, or maybe I've just kind of gone off on my own thing, but if it's not so much what the character learns, but it's what the audience learns? Oh, right, okay. No, that, no, that's a good one. I mean, the, the, what, one of the most interesting things about, I, I really like, I really like um, one of the biggest things always for me is, is the dramatic irony thing. What is the stuff that the character knows that the audience doesn't? What is the stuff the audience knows that the character doesn't? What do you both mutually know? And but playing with those knowledges is a really interesting way of getting the audience to participate. You know? Because you are signaling to them that sometimes they have more knowledge than the character. That's always a really important thing. Because if the audience has more knowledge than the character, they are already projecting what might happen to the character if the character doesn't have this piece of information. And I play with dramatic irony a lot in the stuff that I contribute to because I like the play that says this is not necessarily about solving problems or about what happens next. It's about who has the knowledge of what, and playing with that idea. You know, and you know I, I feel that in everyday life. You know, we, we, we're great sort of perceivers of other people on no knowledge whatsoever. You know, we, we guess people's narratives on the basis of what they look like, on how they move, on you know their action on a bus or whatever it is. And yet we know nothing about them, you know? So what happens when we do know something about them? How does that shift our position, you know? And I do a lot of work in sessions with, on that, you know, about shifting positions. And try and extend that. I was talking about this on the, um, on the screenwriting network thing recently. And I don't know if people who, who have that saw the debate about ethics. It was quite interesting. And I, and I, I do a lot of these exercises on moral dilemma, about how you problematize moral dilemma. And that's often about what do people know and what, the, what don't they know, you know? And about how that, when they become morally and ethically involved. You know? And I love those exercises because it always puts people in, in, in a position about them having to judge the kind of limits of what they're prepared to do and say, you know? And I think I, I gave the, the example, I think the, the guy was talking about um, a rape scene, I think, wasn't he? I think, I think, I think a guy, for those who saw that, he, he had a real problem because a writer refused to remove a, what he perceived to be a gratuitous rape scene. And he said, I don't know how to test that. I don't, I don't know how to get him to see that differently. And, you know, I mean, for me, that, you know, that, that would have been a whole set of exercises 
about, you know, our personal knowledge. You know, is the person being raped your wife? You know, is it a stranger? You know, is it this context? Is it that context? You know, how do you push the position of the knowledge to get people to understand that you can't arbitrarily think of an action like that dramatically? You have to contextualise it. You have to find who knows what where. So that's my general answer to that, in the sense that it's kind of like, I, I, I think that if you can position the audience in ways, I mean, Hitchcock is the classic in that it's a vision. He positions the audience all the time to actually make us think one thing whilst he's doing something else. Then it gives us a piece of information that changes our perception of that. You know? So I'm very keen on that idea about dramatic irony. What does the character know? What does the audience know? When does the other know? No, not. You know? And I think that gets into sort of shaping stories quite differently. Does that help? Yes. Well, but my, 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 my thought was is that it's not really, if, you, if we want to kind of switch things up, yeah. And the typical three X structure, how does the character change? How are they different yeah. again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe we don't care about that. Maybe we care about how the audience change. Uh, oh, oh that's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I completely agree with that. And I think, and I think, yeah. So, certainly, some of the kind of, I mean, I think Linda, Linda Aronson's book's good on that, about, you know, different kinds of narrative that position the audience differently. You, you know, if, if you've got different kinds of narrative and you're being asked into the narrative in a different way, then, you know, the audience changes its, its point of view, you know, quite often as a, as a result of that. So, you know, I, I think it is a really interesting area, and I think sort of pushing people's perceptions around of things um, is really an opening. Again, animation does that. Short independent animation films often leave you with puzzles, often. Little conundrums and little kind of, hang on, hang on what was that about? Just a minute, you know. And, and, and that's partly about that repositioning. It's about saying, you figure this out. Go on, you know. And that's not to say that the, that the person making it is being arbitrary, you know. Prepare, it's the, it's the classic case of that. He knows what his own films are about. He's not, you know, he's not stupid. He knows, he knows exactly what his own films are about. But his whole kind of positioning of what, how he shows you that is all about saying to an audience, make of that what you will, you know, and inviting an answer. And so, there, you know, there can be a bit of a struggle there. You know, half an audience will go, blimey, this is fascinating. Half an audience will go, God, you know. And I asked him about that. I said, you know, does it concern you? And he said, look, he said, I understand my audience to be this. He said, it doesn't matter that my audience might be this. I would like it to be this, and that's fine by me, you know. So, you know, it's about trusting that in a certain way, you know. One of the questions I was thinking about when you were talking was to do with uh, the use of space and landscape. Yeah. Oh, we, yeah, yeah. Which is obviously on my mind at the moment. Yeah. And in the, in the live action screenplay, you'll get interior, Senate House, yes. and yes. that's it. And you're off talking about what the action is and what the dialogue's going to be. Yes. And I thought the example from uh, 2D TV was really good because it showed how the, the metamorphic qualities of landscape feed into yeah. the, the animated screenplay as a whole. Yeah. And you know, that's an example of, of a 2D form where there's little distinction between background as an industrial yeah. element and character as an industrial element. Yeah. So I just wondered if you could maybe expand a little bit more on the, the opportunities to have the landscape itself yeah. become an animated yeah. element of the screenplay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, well, as you know, the, the thing I'm going to do for your for your book is about sporting environments, you know. And it's and, and I've just finished this book on <coughs> animation, uh, sport, and culture, because I saw some really big intrinsic relationships between sport and animation as a as a as a, as a method, as a, as a way of interpreting motion and, and all of those things. <coughs> and I think what's really interesting about that is that one of the assumptions. It really about you know landscape in many senses is either that it is a background or that it is something that you look at from afar. It is over there. It is, it is whatever. So what really interests me about animation uh, landscapes are largely their proximity as characters, as potential characters. You know, how does a landscape function? And in this particular, you, know, you take that example, the tennis court. You know, the tennis court. How does it function? What are the elements on there? But turn it into <coughs> something that is obviously uh, something that's there, obviously for the conduct of the game, but thereafter can become an animated landscape of sorts. And so, what can move? You know, I mean, no. The first basic question 
and led to that thing that I was talking about about suspense was the fact that it's grass, you know, it's a grass. So how do I buy a few seconds, you know? I could have a few more come on tins, but can I do something? Well, you know, moles buried burrow through grass, I'll change the landscape in that way, you could argue, you know? And equally, the net is there, the equipment's there, you know, it's full, it's full of technologies that change. And so basically, all the objects and the characters almost become the landscape too. They become part of its operative space. You know, I first, you know, years ago when I talked about drawn animation as kind of having an ontological equivalence, you know, everything's coming from the same source. Everything's coming from the same starting place. So in, in essence, you know, everything becomes a landscape, certainly in 2D, some aspects of 3D, some aspects of puppetry. Does that sort of answer the question a bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was surprised a little bit to see how much uh, work you put into codifying what would take place in terms of the animation of the landscape. There was very little scope left for the animator to be creative and to go well, off in different in, in, a, in, a, in a certain sense, I think, I mean, it was just lucky in that case particularly. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I choose that, because it was highly specific in yeah. some ways. But the reason I wanted to make it highly specific was, was Partly because I wanted it to be about two seconds. Mm. You know, it's about the moment where you're going to surf. You know, and it's that just that two seconds. So what can you know? What can illustrate that two seconds? So I wanted to be highly specific about that in terms of the way he looked, what's he seeing, how is he feeling, what's what's he doing, what's going on in his head, you know, what's his body doing, you know, and all of that just to do two seconds. That's highly precise enough. But that, that was particular in that case. I've written more generic stuff in that way. But, um, but it's exactly about that. It's about that kind of way of, of turning everything into a, 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 you know, a mutable part of a landscape. Yeah. I'm going to ask my question. It's got you, Steve, in there. Animated documentary. Oh, yeah. And Let's get on to that one. So <laughs> obviously, it has to be written in as much as it, it kind of because it has to be kind of pre-visualized in order to, you can't just go out and start drawing. I mean, yeah. uh, but it seems to be something that's kind of being used to yeah, approach nice. things in all kinds of, and I recently saw, I mean, a, from this film called Kiss the Water, it's a fly fishing film, with yeah. a huge kind of rather wonderful oil Paint animation on glass. Is it Petrov? Is it Petrov in that? Do you know, Chris? I know. No, it's it's. I know the name, and she's quite. She's taught by Sue Lockwood, actually. Oh, well, okay, it's, so it's, it's in English. It? It's English, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and and all done by one woman, yeah. kind of. But also, even watching uh, the Errol, Errol Morris's latest film and the extent to which he uses yeah. kind of animated text, or kind of almost to deal with the culmination of his conceptual ideas or his intellectual oh, yeah, ideas, yeah, yeah. it's actually animation is the place where he can start to, yeah. to convey that. And well, this, this, this big one, this one, I mean, you know, it's the round stuff, this is a good, this good one this way. It took us ages and ages and ages to even convince the documentary crowd that animation documentary existed, you know. <laughs> and it was, it was, um, was it, 19... Oh, God. early 2000s maybe, we finally got a panel at the International Animation Documentary Festival in Amsterdam. It's the biggest one in the world, two weeks, documentaries from all, all across the world. We finally got a panel there of animated documentaries, and two programs were of animated documentaries. I did a panel, and you know, we talked about animated documentary. Packed place, and everybody going, there is no such thing as animated documentary! Questions, anyone? Calm down. It was all of that stuff. But what was great was in the midst of that, thankfully for us, is Nick Broomfield there and Werner Herzog. <laughs> and they both stand up and they vehemently, vehemently defend the fact that animated and documentary are not oppositional things. You know, they are, you know, uh, permanent. What happened after that? Well, what happened after that is that animation studies really grabbed animation documentary. You know, I mean, that's, you know, A, there have been loads and loads of animated documentaries of all kinds. But that's where theory went in animation. You know, people really, really chased it. You know, and uh, very good uh, uh, issue uh, edited by Jeffrey Scholar of the Animation Cross Disciplinary Journal about it. Bella Hermes Rowan just released her what was a PhD. We had to really push that on quickly with Paul Grove to get that out. So like, you know, you always did to get it out there. You know, because the literature is very important. And animation documentary became a big kind of issue. 
The only problem, for me anyway, uh, is the fact that it's also got a bit stuck, you know, animation documentary. Where do we go with it? You know, now as it happens, um, PhD that I'm doing with, with Samantha Moore, I don't know whether people have seen Sam's films, or I thought Sam was a brilliant film to see. But she's doing some really interesting stuff in her PhD, and I think she'll shove that debate forward a bit further. But certainly animation studies has grabbed that, and animation documentary certainly is everywhere, you know? And um, it's still being theorised, but I mean, I, I spoke about this at Edinburgh in the night years ago, saying, look, let's stop now theorising animated documentary. Let's just get on with it. Let's just talk about it in other ways. What's it about? What are these documentaries about, you know? If we're doing it this way, what, what, what's it for, you know? So that, you know, there's lots of stuff Stuff has happened, but, you know, so there's a big literature now in animation, you know, dealing with that. Well, if, oh. I just had a brief question about, <coughs> as maybe going slightly off topic, but writing for, I suppose, CG, because obviously oh, yeah, there's yeah, a crossover yeah. now. Yeah. Um, I don't know, just kind of my experience is there does seem to be a bit of a gap often between the people writing for it and then the actual people creating it. Execution, it often, yeah. yeah. Because, because obviously the idea of drawn animation is a very some easy thing to understand yes. or stop motion, but then as soon as you go into CG, unless you actually use the software, it's very hard to know what's kind yeah. of possible. Um, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was only until, I've got to say, until I became familiar with Maya particularly, mm. that I had a sense of moving beyond what we might call obvious geometries and yeah. obvious design idioms, you know. Mm. But the software, like it does, minute by minute changes, becomes much more user-friendly. Yeah. Um, and also, the big studios have always got their, you know, their custom proprietary stuff anyway. Mm. And certainly, many of the, you know, the big studios anyway want to try and make sure that, you know, classical notions of animation in terms of, you know, drawn form and classical principles still underpin mm. ways in which, you know, certainly the execution is done. Where the big attention, I, I, it seems to me, is, is on scenes and just, mm. you know, the very particularities of scenes. Um, so the acting, you know, and the specificity of the choreography yeah. um, works as, at best with the software as is humanly possible, shall we mm. say. So almost the seamless idea of, you know, sort of naturalistic performance is not challenged by the way in which it, it's depicted. Yeah. 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 But you're quite right that in fact, you know, it's like when graphic designers or illustrators use something like motion, which mm. in fact is, is pretty much a, a, you know, a 3D Photoshop really. And a mm. lot of people are finding that very useful to just move things around, you know, much yeah. more intuitive in that. Yeah. But that's changing the way in which you know people might tell particular kinds of stories. So graphics are being used more pertinently in storytelling accordingly. So the software partly drives it in that yeah. way. I was just more thinking about say like because the film I found really interesting. I mean, at least him less so, but District Nine. Oh yeah. That, that was done by somebody who. So even though at the time of day he set yeah. scenes. Yeah. Was to was to make the you know the the CG elements look good or. And he also talked about not putting stuff on the pedestal as well. Yeah, so like, you know, hiding yeah. stuff, hiding yeah. stuff. I think is real, really a big, big thing. You know, yeah. the broad composition of the image. You know, I think, I think, sort of like um, places like Cinefix. You know, talk about this all the time about yeah. how movies became too much like illustration. Everything was yeah. too precise. Everything was too particular in the composition. Yeah. So there was a kind of wave then that says, how do we dirty things up? You know, how do we how do we not use those things quite so precisely? Mm. How do we kind of like almost you know work against the software and what it's giving us? You know, um, but I think all of these things are day by day things, and if you're working with them, you know, you probably get far more insight into into how that stuff's working. But there's no doubt that it is instrumental. Yeah. yeah. I suggest now we have some a small amount of wine left over, uh, but I think let's kind of let Paul sit down. I'm sure we can carry on. Well, thanks, thanks very much for coming. Yeah, thanks, thanks for your